Let me take this opportunity of welcoming each and every one along to our service today. We welcome you in the Savior's precious, precious name. Now, before we do anything else uh, this morning, there's a passage of Scripture that I would like to read to you. You needn't turn to it. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And this is what it says. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Before we do anything else, we want to bow in prayer, and we want to pray for our new king and queen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we bow humbly in thy presence today. In the name of the Lord Jesus, our Savior, we come before thee pleading the merits of his precious blood. And, O God, as thy word instructs us today, indeed exhorts us to pray for kings and for all in authority, we do remember especially King Charles III today. We ask the Lord that you would bless him. And, O God, we ask thee most of all that he would come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We do pray for the Queen as well. We thank thee, Lord, that we can pray for those in authority. And we do ask thee, Lord, for our nation, that you would come, Lord, and send us a breath of revival. We thank thee, Lord, that God is still on the throne. And we praise thee that the one who's on the throne is King of kings and Lord of lords. And, O oh God, we acknowledge today that someday that every one Lord ever born will bow the knee to Christ the King. Lord, undertake for us now. We just commit our nation to Thee. We earnestly pray for a moving of God, the Holy Spirit, in our nation, right from the throne, right down, Lord, to the pauper on the street, that there might be a moving of Thy gracious Holy Spirit even in these days, and Lord, to Thee we will give the praise, the glory, and every bit of the honor. For it's in Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing our opening hymn. It's hymn number 515 in our own hymn book. Is your life a channel of blessing? Is the love of God flowing through you? Are you telling the lost of the Savior? Are you ready His service to do? And we're going to stand while we sing this opening hymn.
Now let us all unite our hearts together again in prayer. And as we come to pray, we want to remember some families that have been bereaved this week. First of all, our sister, Mrs. Jacqueline MacDonald, has had a sudden bereavement in her family circle. And we want to sympathize with Jacqueline and the MacDonald family at this time and assure them of our prayers. And also, our sister, Mrs. Ruth Pickering's mother passed away this week, and to Ruth and the Pickering family, we sympathize with them as well. And also, the Reverend John Todd passed away uh, this week as well. And to Mrs. Todd and her family, we again want to remember them in prayer. So let's remember these dear families. Our Father, we thank Thee again for this another Lord's Day that finds us in the house of God, the living to praise Thee. And, O oh God, we would remember these families collectively this morning that have been plunged into bereavement. We pray, Lord, that you would draw strangely near, that you would comfort hearts even at this time. O oh God, you know all the circumstances of these bereavements, and we do just pray, Lord, that the families might know the very nearness, the presence of the Lord with them. Draw near, Lord. We thank Thee, Lord, as we pray often, and as Thy Word reveals to us that Thou art the God of all comfort. O oh God, comfort hearts, even this Lord's day. We do thank Thee, Heavenly Father, for another Sabbath that finds us in the house of God. We pray, Lord, that You'll bless every head bowed in Your presence, that You would come, Lord, and meet with us, even, Lord, as we would read the Word of God and we would meditate upon the Scriptures of truth. Lord, that you might have a word in season for each and every one of our hearts. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we might leave God's house today, saying it was good to have been here. For here the Lord spoke to us, and here the Lord drew us closer to himself. O oh God, we pray for the Spirit of the, the Lord to work in our hearts. We thank thee for each head bowed in your presence, for each one that's saved. O oh God, we thank thee for that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus that we have day by day. Oh God, what a blessing it is to know the God of heaven through the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior. And oh God, we just pray for those in our congregation who are still strangers to grace and to God, that even this day, Lord, that you would draw them to Christ and redeem them by your precious blood. Bless all our sister congregations. Bless everywhere indeed where thy word is going forth, where men are true to the book and true to the blood. Bless, Lord, the proclamation of thy word this Lord's day. May this, may this be a high day for the preaching of the gospel, when many will come and put their faith and trust in Christ. So undertake for us now, in Jesus' precious, precious name, we ask it. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing another hymn, folks, 624. Here in thy name we are gathered. Come and revive us, O Lord. There shall be showers of blessing. Thou hast declared in thy word. Let's stand again and let's really sing it out with all of our hearts.
Please turn in the Bible for our scripture reading today, again to the book of Revelation, and we read, first of all, some verses at the end of chapter 1 of Revelation, and then we'll read some verses at the end of Revelation chapter 2, commencing at the verse 18. Revelation chapter 1 and the verse 18. Again, let me remind you, these are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself the only king and head of his church, and he's speaking from heaven. And of course, he's giving John these messages to send to these seven churches at Asia. Look what he says in verse 18 of chapter 1. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels, or the ministers, or the pastors of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Then verse 18 of chapter 2. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I give her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except I repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already. Hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father." And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. We'll end our reading there again, knowing the Lord will add his own blessing to the public reading of his word to all of our hearts. It is good to see so many in God's house today. We welcome you in the Savior's name again. If you are visiting, we give you a very warm welcome. And those tuning through the social media, we welcome you as well, praying that the Lord will meet with us all again this Lord's day. The announcements are as follows. Remember the gospel service tonight at 6.30 p.m., and Keith and Karen Lindsay will be here as our guest singers, and I'll be preaching this evening on the subject, the King. So please come along tonight again. Bring your friends and family with you. Remember the time of prayer beforehand. If you can come that little bit earlier, then come and join with us at 6 p.m. Also tonight in our church in Bethany, for the young people, there's an after youth rally, and that will be at 8.45. And I know, young people, you've been made very welcome at that service, uh, that youth rally this evening. Do remember that uh, after the service next Sunday morning, next Sunday morning we are observing the Lord's table, just to give you a prior warning to that place. And of course, as we announce, the Lord's table is for the Lord's people. On Tuesday night, the prayer meeting at 8 o'clock, and I'll be here 
God willing to take that prayer meeting on Tuesday evening. Wednesday, the little treasures at 10 a.m. And then for the committee and for the session, committee meeting at 7 p.m. on Thursday night, men. Please do remember that. And then we'll have a session meeting afterwards. Youth Fellowship this week, Friday night at 8 p.m. And this is the last of your fellowship meetings before you break off for the summer. So young people, do remember your last meeting this Friday night. Services next Lord's Day, the Sunday school and the Bible classes at a quarter past 10. Services 11.30 and 6.30 p.m. And next Sunday night, our brother Ethan McKillen will be here to sing in the gospel. So remember the special gospel uh, rally again next Sunday evening. Now also next Sunday afternoon, we're going to commence one uh, the first of our open-air services during the month of May and June. And it will be in Tandragee at the top of the town there at the War Memorial, and it will be at 3 p.m. And if you can come along and join with us, then you'll be made very welcome. If you can help out in the open-airs in any way, especially those who have helped before, but also new folk, very, very welcome. If you would see our brother Thomas Hanna, Thomas is in charge of organizing the open airs. You please see him, and he'll, he'll be sure to fit you in somewhere along the line. But we need help with those open airs as well. And there's good witness around the town and around the villages surrounding Tandragee. Uh, so please, please take that upon your heart. The first aid refresher training classes, and we've been announcing this, will take place on Wednesday the 10th of May at 6 p.m. and also Saturday the 13th of May at 9 a.m. in the morning. Now, please take note of those dates and times. Wednesday the 10th of May at 6 p.m. and Saturday the 13th of May at 9 a.m. in the church here. Now, if there's anyone else who would like to go to these classes and you haven't signed up to them yet, then please see our brother Philip Beatty, ASAP. Please do that. Now also there's a little uh, coronation Bible uh, uh, leaflet that you can get. Uh, some of the young people will be giving them out today. And uh, please get one of those as you leave. A coronation Bible marker. And there's one, I think, for everyone as you leave the church today. The Reverend Parks' new book, 100 days after lockdown, there's still some copies left, £10 each. All proceeds will be going to the missionary work. So if you'd like one of those, there are both exits as you leave. Please take one. Of them. You can put your name down on the sheet as we've been announcing, and you can pay it later. At our presbytery meeting on Friday night, which was in Clocher Valley, the Reverend Samuel Murray was elected as the new moderator of our presbytery. And the Reverend Murray will be taking up his position, new position, in September. And I would ask you as a congregation to please take him upon your heart and to pray for him, that the Lord will bless him as he takes up this new role. Do please remember to do that. I'd like to read out a letter. This letter I've received from Tondergee District LOL number 4. Dear Reverend Gray, on behalf of the officers and members of Tondragee District LOL No. 4, we would like to thank you and the members of Tondragee Free Presbyterian Church most sincerely for your help and assistance with our Mission Orange. The mission ran from Sunday the 23rd of April until Friday the 28th of April, and it was widely regarded as a massive success. The Word of the Lord was preached, and it's our earnest hope that some seeds that have been planted in the minds and hearts of those who attended will come and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their own and personal Savior. We're truly grateful to you all for your help and acknowledge that without it, the mission could not have been a success. We all in Tondragee District LOL number no. 4 wish you, the Reverend Gray, and all the members of Tondragee Free Presbyterian Church God's richest blessing now and for the future. And that was sent from Brother Kyle Quinn. And do continue to pray that the seed that has been sown, that it might bring forth uh, abundant fruit. 
Now, I think that is all the announcements I have to make. We're going to sing another hymn, and the offering is going to be taken up. And the hymn is 638 in our own hymn book. 638. Visit us, Lord, with revival, stricken with coldness and dearth. Where is our hope of survival, save in thy life-giving breath? We'll just keep our seats for the first part of the hymn. And we'll make the third verse the last verse, okay? Let us all unite our hearts in prayer again. Let's ask the Lord for his help as we come now and turn to God's Word. Lord, we thank thee again for the precious Word of God. And Lord, we pray now as we turn to the sacred page again that you would anoint us and fill us with thy gracious Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to all of our hearts. O God, we thank thee for your speaking voice to our own hearts and souls. Even, Lord, as we have studied and read, Lord, these letters, these personal letters to these seven churches, O God, how you have challenged our hearts. We pray, Lord, that in these days that you would give us all the gift again of repentance, that we might turn afresh to thee, looking on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So, Lord, undertake for us now, for it's in Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. For a few moments today, I want to draw your attention to the church at Thyatira. Apart from the book of Revelation, the city of Thyatira is only mentioned in one other place in the New Testament. That place, of course, is Acts chapter 16 and the verse 14, where we are told of Lydia that she was a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira. Lydia, of course, was saved through the preaching of the Apostle Paul in the city of Philippi when the Lord opened her heart to receive the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, whether Lydia brought the gospel to her own city of Thyatira, we cannot be sure. But one thing we are sure of, God in His mercy established a gospel-preaching church in the birthplace of Lydia, 
the seller of purple. In Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 to 29, these verses that we have read together, we have a record of how God viewed this church in Thyatira. Again, the Apostle John, who is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes a personal message to the Christians in the church there. As we come this morning to consider the details of this personal letter to these believers, I want you to consider these details in three ways. First of all, we want to look and consider the good things. Then secondly, we want to look and consider the bad things. And then thirdly, we want to look and consider the great things. I'm sure that over these past weeks, as we have been studying these seven churches of Asia, you have observed that the general thrust of each of the letters have been basically the same. And although we have only considered three of these seven churches, so far a familiar pattern is emerging. For example, at the beginning of each letter, we see God setting out clearly the faithfulness of each church. Then, as the letters have progressed, we have seen, secondly, that the Lord has moved on to point out the failures of each church, if there were any. And then, thirdly, God, in conclusion, exhorts each church concerning how they are to conduct themselves in the future, pointing out the consequences if they do not turn from their backsliding. Therefore, as we come this morning to consider the church at Thyatira, let us observe simply, again, what the Lord is saying to them here in this personal letter. Now, let me emphasize again that it is the Lord that is sending these personal letters to this, these churches. And while John is the pen writer, he's only writing down what the Lord himself has said. And I pray, therefore, that we'll always keep that uttermost in our minds. It's not what John is saying to the churches, but it's what the Lord is saying. And, of course, the Lord is saying what He sees. And we must always remember, even in this day in which we live, that the Lord, as He looks down from heaven into our church here in Tondragee, he sees everything that's going on. Not only does he see us as a congregation, but he sees us, of course, as individuals. And I pray that that will be a sobering thought to all of our hearts. First of all, I want you to notice the good things. Take a look at verse 19. Here's what the Lord says concerning this church at Thyatira. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Here we have a list of good things which God draws our attention to about this church at Thyatira. In this text of Scripture, we can see their labor, their love, their loyalty, and their long-suffering. Indeed, in verse 19, the honorable character and commendation that Christ gives to this church is outstanding, to say the least. Their service in God's work and their faith in God's Son was undeniable, and their love for souls and their fellow believers was indisputable. And above all, they were growing in grace and in the knowledge of Christ their Savior. Now, it's very important that you see that right at the very beginning here, because that's the first thing, of course, that the Lord draws our attention to concerning these believers in this church. You see, these Christians in Thyatira, unlike their fellow believers in Ephesus, had not lost their first love, but rather their love for Christ had increased throughout the passing years. That is what that little phrase means at the end of verse 19. Look at it again. The last be more than the first. In other words, from the day that they were saved, they were growing wiser and better in the things of God. Not only had their love for Christ increased, 
from the day they were saved, but their zeal for the work of God had increased as well. My, what a wonderful and excellent testimony to have before the Savior. Christ here commends them for these good things that is evident in their lives. You know, child of God, there's a challenge here, of course, for you and me. I wonder, as the Lord Jesus looks into our hearts today as individual Christians, and indeed as a congregation as a whole, can he say the same good things of us as he said of the Christians at Thyatira? Are we increasing and developing in spiritual maturity in our Christian lives? Are we growing in the knowledge of Christ day by day? That's the challenge. That's the challenge that I believe the Lord would draw our attention to as a congregation, but also as individual Christians, those of us who profess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. I want you to keep your hand in Revelation chapter 2 there for a moment. I want you to turn over just a few pages. Turn back a few pages to Second Peter and the chapter 3. And look what it says in verses 17 and 18. Now here we have Peter, and he's writing his epistle here to God's people. And Peter draws our attention again to this subject of growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Child of God, it is so important that we grow in grace day by day, that our walk with God increases as our lives go on upon this scene of time. Are you going forward in your Christian life, or are you going back? Are you going forward in your Christian life, or are you static? That's the challenge, I believe, as we study this church at Thyatira. But look what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. It's possible to go back in the Christian life to backslide in the Christian life. And we have been seeing that even in these studies uh, in the seven churches of Asia. And here the apostle Peter, he warns about backsliding. He warns about going back spiritually. And then he says this in verse 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Oh, I pray in these days, dear child of God, that you and I are advancing in our Christian experience. That means that we will read our Bible more. That means that we will pray more. That means we will get into the place of prayer more. That means that we will continue to seek to walk with God day by day and hour by hour and minute by minute. I pray in these days that our first love will be Christ, and that it will be Christ alone. We could speak about the Christians at Corinth. You know, the Christians at Corinth were like the Christians at Ephesus. Not only had they left their first love, but also they were not maturing and growing in their Christian lives. That's why when Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthian believers, that he said to them, listen to these words, Now, Paul is writing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, to God's people, the church at Corinth. And this is what he says to them. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, where hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. In other words, when Paul wrote his first letter to the Christians at Corinth, they were, instead of going forward in their walk with God, they were going back. They were not maturing spiritually in their Christian lives. Is that you today? Oh, I pray if it is that you will return again to the Lord and seek the Lord while he may be found even this day. 
and that you will begin again to go forward in your Christian walk with God. There are so many things that can hinder us in our walk with God, and of course, the old devil will make sure that day by day the temptation will come our way. That's why it's so important to live close to the Lord. As far as the Christians at Corinth were concerned, they were going back. Now, it was a completely different story when Paul wrote his second epistle to the Corinthians. And you compare 1 Corinthians with 2 Corinthians, and you will see the marked difference in the walk of the believers. Because when we read 2 Corinthians, what a change had taken place in the church, and what a change had taken place in the lives of the Christians at Corinth. You see, the Christians at Corinth, when Paul wrote his first epistle, were not growing in their Christian lives. But this could not be said of the Christians at Thyatira. I believe that the Christians at Thyatira were displaying in their Christian lives the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Well, let me read you Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, godliness, or goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And there's no doubt about it. I believe that the Christians in Thyatira were walking with the Lord, and they were seeking to live their lives before the Lord. And there was certainly an advancement in their Christian experience. However, and of course there's a but here, I want you to turn again to Revelation chapter 2, and I want you to take a look there from verses 20 to 24. Because not only do we see the good things, we see the bad things. Look what it says in verse 20. No, notwithstanding, now remember, this is the Lord speaking, and He's only after commending the Christians at Thyatira in verse 19, but He's coming now to point out to them a few bad things that's taking place among them. And He says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. In the church at Thyatira, there were some wicked seducers. Now, these wicked seducers are compared. Now, I want you to understand that. They're compared to Jezebel and are called by her name. Now, of course, Jezebel, who we read of in the Old Testament, was a persecutor of the prophets of the Lord, and she was a worshiper of Baal and, of course, false religion. Therefore, the sin of these wicked seducers in the church at Thyatira was that they were attempting to draw the true servants of God into sin and religious idolatry. And although they called themselves prophets of the Lord, they were, in fact, the servants of the devil. And the great sin of these seducers was that they made use of the name of God, but it was only so that they could oppose the truth of the gospel. Now, listen to this. The sin that was being committed in the main was not being committed by God's people in Thyatira. While there is no doubt that some of God's people had been driven into this deception. In the main, the body of Christ had turned away from these wicked seducers. However, the failure, and here's what the Lord, I believe, rebuked them for, the failure of the Christian church at Thyatira was that instead of condemning this sin, they ignored it. They ignored it. The church treated the sin as if it did not exist. And because of this failure to deal with this wickedness, God rebukes them here. Now, we have been seeing throughout these studies that 
The Lord has no time for false religion. And child of God, we must always point out, even in this age in which we live, the Lord has no time for false religion. And as we look across our land, there is much false religion. We have already pointed out many of the cults, and of course, again, the Church of Rome, false religion. And God has no time for false religion. Now, some might ask, why should the wickedness of this Jezebel be charged to the church at Thyatira? Well, the answer is simple. Because the church suffered her to seduce the people of that city. Although the church had not the civil power to banish or imprison those wicked people, it had the ministerial power to censor and to excommunicate them from the church but it was neglecting to use this power. Therefore, this made the church at Thyatira sharers in this wicked woman's sin. You see, the truth is this, and 1 Corinthians chapter 5 teaches us this. The oversight of the church has the power to discipline church members who step out of line. But of course, the church at Thyatira, they were feeling to do so. And hear the Lord in verse 20 here and on. He rebukes the church for ignoring this sin that was among them. O child of God, the Lord hates sin. Of that there is no doubt. And of course, He hates sin among His people. And that's what the Lord is pointing out here, not only as we study these words concerning the church at Thyatira, but as we study these seven churches of Asia. And that's why it is so important for a church and for individuals, you and I who are saved, that we walk in holiness of life. The Bible says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And certainly in this day and age in which we live, we need to live those holy lives that will be honoring to the Lord. But as a church, We need to always keep sin outside the door. But as we read on down Revelation chapter 2, I want you to notice this. We can see the mercy of God, even to the worst of sinners, because even these wicked seducers that we read of who were evident in Thyatira could find forgiveness if they would only repent. I wonder, did you notice that? as we were reading down this passage. Look at verse 21, the first part of it. And I give her space to repent of her fornication. Here we have a word in season this morning for all those in our congregation who are not saved. Maybe you're here today and you're not born again of the Spirit of God. You're not redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. Thank God there is forgiveness for you. I don't care what sin you have committed. I don't care how far down the road of iniquity you may have traveled. Thank God today there's mercy with the Lord if you repent. God's mercy will be shown to the vilest sinner if they turn away from their sin in true repentance. And that's what is being taught here I believe in this portion of Scripture, I give her space to repent of her sin, of her fornication. Oh, my friend, how long, how many years has the Lord given you space to repent? You're still not saved, and you've sat under the sound of the gospel now for many, many years, and you're still unconverted, and yet the Lord's mercy is shown towards you again today. And although you have spurned that mercy for many, many years, right up until this moment in your life, you're still rejecting Christ, and yet the Lord's mercy is being shown towards you again today. And thank God, His mercy is real, and He will forgive you if you truly repent and turn from your sin, and by faith accept the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart as your own and personal Savior. But remember this, that God's mercy will end someday. Look what it says in verse 21. I give her space to repent of her fornication. And she repented 
not. And then look at verse 22. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Judgment will come. I know we live in this age, and the doctrine of judgment and the subject of judgment is very rarely preached from pulpits today. But here we have the Word of God. Here we have the last book of the Bible, the book of the Revelation, a book of future events. And as we have emphasized throughout the course of these messages, although we're dealing and considering personal messages that God sent to these seven individual churches, they're messages for you and me today. They're applicable to us in our Christian lives, but also, sinner, they're applicable to you. And here we have a word in season for your heart. God is merciful and has shown that mercy towards you now for many years. He has given you space to repent, time to get right with God, time to be saved. You still haven't taken that opportunity someday because you refuse to repent and come to Christ. Judgment will fall upon you because the Bible says that God hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. And that means he will judge you for your sin. Oh, I pray today that you will come and put your faith and trust in the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. We see the good things that are said. We see the bad things that are said. But Take a look at the great things that are said here. From verse 25 to verse 29, take the time to read all these verses when you go home. There are two great things spoken of at the end of this chapter. What are they? First of all, the scepter of power, and secondly, the star of promise. Look what it says in verse 26. Verse 26 says, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. There's the scepter of power. Now, some believe that this is speaking of the millennium when Christ will reign for a thousand years on the earth with his redeemed people. Others believe that it is speaking of the world to come when believers shall sit down with Christ on his throne of judgment and join with him in trying, condemning, and consigning over to punishment the enemies of Christ and his church. I am more inclined to believe the latter. But whatever this is truly speaking about, one thing is sure, and here's the great truth that is brought out here when we consider the scepter of power. It's this, God's people will reign with Christ forever and ever because this is the blessed hope of every child of God. Oh, dear child of God, isn't it wonderful that someday that you and I will reign with Christ forever and forever and forever because as we're going to find out tonight, His kingdom has no end. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And praise God, someday you and I, as the saints of God, will reign with the King of glory throughout all eternity. Oh, what a blessed hope you have and I have, dear believer, that someday we'll go to be with Christ and reign with Him for all eternity. But take a look at verse 28, because we, we learn here about the star of promise it says, and I will give them the morning star. What is the morning star? Or who is the morning star? Christ is the morning star. Therefore, the Lord here is promising them more of himself. Now, it's important that you understand that. Christ here is promising this church more of himself. You know, when we get home to glory and we reign with Christ on high, we shall see Him as He is. 
In 1 John 3, verse 2, we read these lovely words. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. So we're the sons of God now, child of God. It's not a blessing, not a wonderful, wonderful blessing and privilege that even as we sit in God's house this morning, as God looks down upon us, He looks upon us as the sons and daughters of God. We are the sons of God. Now are we the sons of God. But then the verse goes on to say this. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Here we have a twofold promise from God to those who are overcomers Someday we will reign with Christ. Someday we will rule with Christ. And someday we will see Him as He is and be more like Him. What a tremendous thought. Truth here is brought out at the end of this chapter when God, through His servant John, sends this personal letter to the church at Thyatira. Oh, we're going home to glory soon to see the city bright, to walk the golden streets of heaven and bask in God's own light. We can't even begin to imagine what that's going to be like, dear child of God, when we get home to glory, leave this world with all its cares behind us and enter into our eternal rest. We'll certainly learn more of Christ in that day. What a glorious day that will be. Oh, my friend, but some of you are out of Christ. And held by many a snare, we cannot leave you lost and lone. We want you over there. Would you not come today? Enter into these great things, the great blessings of God's eternal salvation. And you too can receive this scepter of power. And you too can receive this star of promise. And you too someday can go with the redeemed of God and enjoy the eternal blessing of the heavenly King and His kingdom. Would you not come today? What clear lessons do we learn here when we study the church of Thyatira? I'll just list them. Number one, Christ, the great head of the church, sees everything that goes on in His church and among His people. Always remember that. Number two, no matter how faithful we may be as Christians in some areas of our lives, we may lack in other areas. And that's why it's so important, whatever areas we lack, that we see to them and put them right. Thirdly, the reason why Christ commands His people to turn away from evil is because He longs to give us His very best. We can't have God's very best if we don't turn away from all sin. And fourthly, the church's only aim should be to do the will of God and to see Christ glorified in the church and in our own lives personally. Oh, I pray today that that will be our aim and goal in our Christian lives, that that will be our prayer for our church here in Tandragi, that we might do the will of God and see His kingdom extended in the days that lie ahead. May God bless these few thoughts to all of our hearts. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank Thee and we praise Thee for Thy Word. O God, we thank Thee, Lord, for Your blessing in our lives. And yet, Lord, forgive us for our sins today and forgive us for our failures. O God, as we've been looking at these churches, Lord, we thank Thee that There are many areas whereby you commended them, but Lord, there were other areas whereby you rebuked them. And Lord, are we any different? Are we any different in this 21st century? I don't believe we are. Therefore, Lord, help us to walk with Thee in every area of our lives. Bless each believer here. We thank Thee for everyone that professes the name of Christ the Savior. But, O God, may we have those testimonies that will be well-pleasing to the Master. And, O God, we pray in these days that 
you would be pleased to move by your gracious Holy Spirit amongst us. Bless us now. Separate us in thy love. Bless the meeting tonight, Lord. Oh God, the gospel service, we pray that you'll bring us back again under the sound of the gospel of Christ. Bless thy word to every heart. For it's in Jesus' precious name we ask it, and for his glory alone. Amen.